Seeing that it's six o'clock, I am going to call to order the Creek Fire Protection Mute, mute, mute. All right. It is um, roll call. I see and hear acknowledgement, verbal acknowledgement that we are all here. So we will uh, solve that in minutes and look forward to the next inning. Approval of the agenda. Are there any additions to the agenda? Director Dixley, is that you that has, can you mute? Thank you. No. Thank you. Uh, see no additions or directions. Do I have a, a, a motion, motion to approve? Motion to approve the agenda. A second? Second. Did you put the last thing on the agenda, remember? Oh, yes. Uh, we did have. Can you hold it up? I apologize. We did have addition. Um, Director Pixley had pointed out uh, we are probably going to see if the board would write a letter to the Wilson Bike Park to okay. remove the word partnership with Elk Creek Fire on their website. Um, it's going to put our two seconds. That's me, business. Yeah, let me. I apologize. Thanks, Barb. Um, that is correct. I did ask the chief to add that to the agenda last minute. I'm sorry we weren't able to get it on there. And I'm also sorry for the background noise. Why don't we put that as a number two under new business? Okay. With that change, can I have a new motion for approval of the <laughs> agenda? Motion to approve the agenda with the addition. Thank you. A second? Second. second. In favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Um, review of approval of the regular minute meetings. Has everybody had a chance to look at last uh, month's minutes? Let's take a few seconds. Okay. Um, I believe I can move it. I can see the errors myself. Any additions, any changes? Can somebody approve the approve the Make a motion. Minutes. To as approve the minutes. As submitted. submitted. Second. Two. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Rolling along, do we have our audit folks here? They're on Zoom. They're on Zoom. All right. Hey, uh, Eric? Yeah, I am here. Wonderful. You, you have guys hear floor. me okay? Yes. Awesome. I don't know what exactly you guys have in front of you from a standpoint of uh, page, page numbering of documents or um, 
how everything is laid out. So if anybody um, gets lost or needs me to slow down, just just yell at me and and we can uh, take a pause. Okay, so we have copies via email. So okay, let's let's pull this up in a second here. And while you guys are doing that, I plan on keeping it a uh, 30,000 foot view and um, willing to dive into any discussion or any questions that, that anybody has for purposes of uh, kind of what, what all the final reports look like. Which document are you <laughs> Eric, which document are you gonna to refer to first? I'm gonna start with the governance communication. Okay. okay, the letter. Yep, yep. This is really the kind of the roadmap of what audit standards kind of say we're required to report out to the board uh, at the end of the process. Um, so if I was going to keep it three, three or 30,000 foot view, this is that high level view of kind of those important talking points. Um, I mean, really bottom of page one, I think Accounting is not an exact science. There's a lot of information that's uh, within your financial statements that from our standpoint, from auditing standpoints, it's considered an estimate. Uh, so we do procedures over all those numbers uh, and really get to a point where uh, our conclusion is that they're materially correct uh, in all instances. Uh, so for example, really everything related to the pension numbers that you guys have on your financial statements, um, all the way down to even something as probably trivial as your vacation liability is considered an estimate because that number we know is going to change year over year as, as hourly rates or as salaries change. Um, okay. Page two, if there were any difficulties, any disagreements with management, we'd be required to report those out. Uh, there were none. Um, corrected misstatements. One of the other documents I sent over is the adjusting journal entries that were posted this year. There probably looks like a lot more adjusting journal entries than normal. And I think that's strictly related to uh, in prior years, the districts relied a little more heavily on a third party individual. And this year, uh, we, we really didn't or that really wasn't used by the district just kind of due to scheduling and timing. Um, so for purposes of the audit, we posted a lot more adjusting journal entries. And so you'll see those in the uh, adjusting journal or journal entry report. Okay. I don't think we have that, Kent. I'm trying to see if it's in the, is an addendum to the. And I can email that over to Barbara too. Um, and she can, uh, provide those to the board if needed. Yeah, that'd be helpful. I don't, I'm not finding it yet. Most, do you know, Barbara, was it included in the- Eric, was that a separate, set, sorry, separate document? It, it was, it was. It, it would have came through as just a separate PDF. Uh, I believe it was a two page PDF. Okay, yeah, I can send that to them. Okay, okay, perfect. That's really all I had for purposes of the governance letter. Uh, comments, questions, concerns. Uh, Eric, this is Kent Wagner. Just, in, just since we don't have the adjustment piece, that, and there's nothing that is irregular in there. It's just the sheer amount that you had this year is all the concern you all had. Um, really, nothing different than I think what the third party individual uh, has always done. Um, so I guess when, when I think or from our, in our world, when we think of adjusting journal entry at the very beginning of the process, Barbara gives us a, a trial balance. And to us, that's kind of an unadjusted quote unquote final trial balance. What you see in front of you in your audited financial statements is now the final, final numbers. And so any adjusting journal entries we posted to get from the initial document we've been given to what you're seeing in your financial statements is what we call adjusting journal entry. 
Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And so in prior years, the third party individual, she really did a lot of the adjustments from that first document and then gave us kind of a more finalized document. So that's really the difference. Um, really nothing unusual or nothing out of line. It's just more along the lines of, of just the number of entries that we posted compared to normal. Okay, great. Thank you. That'll be helpful once we get that report. So thank you. So with that, on. I'm going to, I'm going to jump to the next document, which, which is just uh, Elk Creek Fire Financials 2021. And then I'm going to jump all the way down to page three, kind of the meat and potatoes of the entire process. Um, fiscal year ended December 31, 2021, um, unmodified clean opinion. Uh, again, so kind of a, a kudos to kind of what you guys are doing out there with the district and kind of managing um, the process, the finances, and kind of the, the controls surrounding everything, if that um, makes sense. Um, I do think it's important to point out, we draft the financial statements for the district. We prepare kind of all those pension entries that are based on FPPA's reports. Um, we can do that. Management is still responsible for all of that preparation, presentation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I do think that's important to point out. Really our responsibilities um, stop and end with kind of obtaining reasonable assurance in all material respects. So we, we do a lot of what we call non-attest services and ultimately the board and management are the ones taking responsibility um, for those financial statements. Uh, the only big piece, not big piece, the only part that I was really gonna touch on related to the financials is down on page PDF page 17. Okay. One of the things that um, is a little different from this year than I think in years past is really that number that you see, where is it? Under assigned capital reserve, $850,000. We took a look at the district budget for 2022 and really what, what, we kind of set up this year is more um, in 2022, the, the district really um, budgeted a board designated reserve. There's about $100,000 in there. And then there's a capital reserve fund that's in there for uh, 750,000. So what we, what we went ahead and did is we just kind of carved that out, called it assigned 850,000 so that the board or the readers of the financial statements can kind of look at this and say, okay, somewhere down the line over the course of the next year, two years, um, the board's kind of starting to set aside or has reserves in place for capital projects, capital expenditures, uh, whatever it may be. So that's really kind of the only, um, I guess, change from what you see last year to this year. Any more? Other than that, no, I wasn't going to get into too much detail on the financial statements. Um, same, you know, same operations as, as the prior year, same, um, same revenue stream, same expenditures going out the door. Nothing really changed other than the numbers themselves, which I know you guys are looking at and talking at length during your board meetings. So you probably don't want to listen to me sit and go through it. Let me ask the board members if there are any questions, concerns as you go on through this. Yeah. I don't have any at this point, but I have just the details. So I'm going to reserve the right the next meeting. If I find something that we don't understand to bring it up, okay. that's okay. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Um, that. Do you have a right. comment? 
I have no questions. So I assume then that this the auto report is done. This is the report out to us, and um, there's no action needed by us on any of this aspect. Correct. Nothing. Okay. Well, I appreciate the report and um, and the materials that we have before us, and thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, again, I'd just like to say thanks to, to Barbara for working through this this year's engagement with us and uh, kind of making our life easy as we got through all of the, the questions and the requests and um, got it to this spot. And everything's been loaded up to the um, state auditor's website. So I think for all intents and purposes, your 2021 year is done and behind you. That's excellent news. All right. Director Wagner, this is Director Pittsburgh. Yes. Um, I would like to make a motion to accept the audit as presented. Okay. We have a second to approve the audit as, as presented. Second. Okay, hey, all in favor? Aye. 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 The presentation from Sharon, but come back if we need to. <laughs> if I have questions, Eric, this is Sharon Woods, I'm the treasurer of the board. And if I have questions, I will formalize those and get them to you, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to send them over and I'll take a look and get you um, or get you a response to whatever you send. No reason to doubt what's here, none whatsoever, since that's your job, just to audit our financials. But I might just have some questions, is all. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. And with that, Eric, I, I thank you for your time, and I think that ends our our uh, agenda item with with you. So thank you very much. Awesome. You guys all take care. Great Thanks. night. Bye. And going from one financial. Agenda right. item to the next. To the next. Director Woods, it's yours. Okay. So this is the July financials for the August 11th board meeting. Um, then just the next slide would be great. Thank you. So looking at, at revenue, um, in July, we are at 70% of budgeted revenue, and technically we're 58% throughout the year. So revenue is tracking as expected. What you're looking at is a, a linear budget. In other words, one twelfth of the revenue of the month. So you would expect it to eventually level out and be very close to what we budgeted. This is just easier to present than kind of ups and downs. Um, overall revenue is looking good. Property taxes, as usual, accounted for 99% of the revenue numbers. Um, it's up about 774,000 versus last month, 773,000 of that is property taxes. We expect July to have a bump in property taxes because a lot of people divide their property taxes up to one half in February, one half in June. So we expect to see that jump. And guess what? We saw the jump, there it is. Um, ownership taxes, can you need to be greater than budget? Now, those are a small percentage um, of the overall revenue. And you know, the only thing I can say is that there's a lot of supply chain issues with new vehicles. So it's possible, and used vehicles, so it's possible people just aren't getting as much new vehicles or used vehicles. Ambulance billings are still um, not exactly on track. They're going up but they're still below what the budget was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're gonna present grants today, right? So I'm not mentioning- oh, Specifically one, yeah. Just one, just the one. Okay, that's fine. Next slide. If anybody has any questions, raise your hand. Overall expenses, again, are uh, running under budgeted amount. We are still expecting legal expenses to provide a bump. Because we haven't seen 
lot of expense for legal expenses and we're expecting to see those. Training, we haven't hired the deputy chief for training yet. So again, that's driving the expense numbers down. Um, I think you're interviewing firefighters and MDs as we speak. Correct. We've, we've hired a firefighter EMT and we have an open position right now. That we're so we have open positions there. Next slide. <clears throat> this is um, 221 income versus 222 income, net income. So we don't do a budget for net income, we do a budget for expenses. And um, so what you can see is it's tracking very similar to net income last year. We will expect net income to start to come down because revenues will start to come down. There won't be, there might be delinquent property taxes coming in, but for the most part, we have received the bulk of our property tax revenue, which is the biggest revenue number. Next slide. So this is property tax revenue on a monthly basis. It kind of looks a little weird. You see the bumps, right? And they're sort of on track with what we expect to see later in the year where property tax levels level off. Next slide. We're looking at annual. And, and at this point in the year, annual is probably more easy to look at, a better measure to look at. So on an annualized basis, you can see that property taxes are very close to what was budgeted. Um, 3.546 million actual versus 3.548 budgeted. So again, we're tracking exactly as we would expect revenue to track. Next slide. Labor. Labor is the biggest expense that Elk Creek has. And with most fire departments, you would expect that. So I've done, I've made some changes to my budgeted numbers based on discussions with Chief and Barbara. So what this number represents is our labor costs net of what we bill the other districts. Mm -hmm. We bill 100% of fuel services, we bill 50% of prevention services, and we bill 50% of maintenance to um, entertainment. So what you're looking at is more of a pure number. And you can see that Again, expenses are tracking, labor expenses are tracking pretty close to what we budgeted. Um, 1.622 million versus a budget of 1.651 million. So again, the numbers look very close to what we anticipate them to be. Next slide. So this is labor with no SERP expenses, because again, we build a state for surf expenses. We build them more than just labor, but this is only net of labor. So what you see again is expenses are very close to what we budgeted. Um, I don't know what else to say, but then we're managing labor. For now, um, we expect the surf labor costs to increase over the rest of the year as fires. Ramp up, even though they are, well, they've already ramped up. Okay, next slide. This is just CERF by itself. And what you can see is we budgeted CERF to really ramp up towards the end of the year. And what you can see with actuals is they are starting to ramp up. So these are labor costs for CERF. Again, we build that out to the state. So we should end up in a cash position of even on certain expenses. But I just thought, come on, we're we'll okay. Next slide. Okay, so this is where we are with CERF expenses. At this point, we have billed to the state about 364,000 surf expenses. That's the, the, the graph that's in black. This graph gets a little weird to read, but eventually I think it sort of looks okay. <laughs> looks a little weird. So we built 364. So next slide. 
We have been reimbursed at this point for 84,771,000. So almost 85,000. The difference is, you know, we build the state and then they examine the documents that we send them. There's a lot of back and forth, you know, is this really what we're wanting? And eventually they agree. Last year we billed 1.2 million to the state and we got every dime of that back. It just came in like the first quarter of 2022. That's where we are. Um, right now, the aging is about 37 days from the time we submit the payment to the, the bill to the state to the time we get payment. So a little over a month at this point. Right. So that means we have 279000 left to be paid. I'm going to make a point. I don't want anybody to get alarmed. But at this point, we have build the state through the end of June, but we have not billed them yet for the CERF expenses for July. I expect that to happen in the next you know, two to three weeks. So what you're looking at, if you go to the next slide, is the 402,000, almost 403,000 of CERF expenses, not all of those have been billed yet to the state. We've only billed 364,000. So we will be billing the rest of that. It's just there's a little bit of a delay. Um, and again, just noting that as of last year, 2021, we submitted 1.2 million to the state and they paid us every dime. So we expect to get that reimbursement again. Next slide, any questions? Nobody has any questions. Next slide. <laughs> well, you know, you got to raise your hand. You raise your hand. <laughs> we'll, we'll cover, I'll cover my question with the chief later. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like is a motion to approve the expenses for the month of July of $374,205.14. So if somebody would make a motion to approve that expense number, that would be special. Motion to approve one hundred and seventy four thousand three hundred and seventy four thousand two hundred and five dollars and thirteen cents for the month of July. Second. In favor? In favor. Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. We're up to you, Chief. It's my job. Right. Chiefs for the board. All right, so um, I do want to start this with a uh, kind of heavy day today. Um, last night at 1230, there was a guy from Craig Hotshots who was killed in on fire in Oregon. Um, we work very closely with Craig Hotshots. We send people from our module to detail with them. And actually, as uh, module leader, Jake Pep, who said he was on the phone with those guys on the way into Oregon for this fire. To send another detailer out with the guys. So it's kind of a sobering moment. It's kind of close to home. You know, it unfortunately it does happen. It's, it's a very dangerous job. Oh, yeah. I think it was a, a challenging day. But <laughs> yesterday, uh, Chief, and actually, yeah. Chief uh, Director Wagner, if I could take a point of personal privilege and ask that us as a collective have a moment of silence for your colleague and for our colleague in this. Uh, terrible loss. Yes. Yes. I'll let you direct everyone. Can I just ask all of you to take a moment to collect your thoughts and send support to the family and the firefighter who passed this last night today. So it is. Um, so you may see a couple bills from across the price and some people uh, Craig comes back and talks to his funeral and come back east. All right. So, and then other less than great news. Um, we had to make a tough decision to cancel the 2022 Fire Academy graduation. It was supposed to be held this Saturday. 
It was a tough decision. We had a lot of meetings and a lot of discussions about it, but we ended up several key individuals having, they had to cancel at the last moment. It was my decision. I didn't feel that having a graduation just kind of completed was worth it. It should be a very special day for everybody. And we ended up having our bagpiper left on a fire assignment. So then the honor guard, they ended up canceling because most of them left on a fire assignment. The venue had two janitors walk out, and so we couldn't get into rehearse, and they weren't even sure if we'd have chairs set up, so we'd have to do that. It just everything was stacking up where it just didn't it didn't seem like the the right thing to do. So we did that. Um, we're gonna push it out, and it's gonna be a uh, date in January. Hopefully, fire season won't mess that up, and we'll we'll fix that. It was a it was a, not the best. David, he was the right thing to do, I think, because it is an important ceremony, and I, I don't want to cheapen it by yeah. not having certain things. Fire season continues to march on across the West. Many areas have seen a lot of large fires and a lot, and some catastrophic losses have been suffered. In our own district, on the other hand, fire danger remains moderate. Um, it's the same across the National Forest. I don't remember seeing fuel fire danger and fuel moisture moderate in August and the forest around us in years. Testament, all the rain we've had, it's 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 excellent. It's very good. So what it's been allowed, uh, it's allowed us to uh, continue to send resources out. Currently, we have an engine out in Texas, and all the re resources are home. Our module is probably going to go available I think, tomorrow, and they'll probably get out again. We've still probably got. It looks like the moisture is going to continue at least for another couple of weeks, so we should stay in this kind of wet low fire danger trend. We'll continue to evaluate, we'll evaluate the fuels and fire danger. And as soon as it picks up, we're probably going to keep all our resources here. Elevation celebration took place at the end of July. It was a super success. It was fun. We ended up working with Intercane and providing us services. It's always a challenge. A lot of our volunteers, they just don't have time to commit to these weeks. So we had a great staffing with volunteers with World Career Stop on Saturday. And then Inner Canyon took it on Sunday. And I do believe it was, was it a record number of people? It seemed like an awful lot. I, I don't know. There were a lot of people there. It was, it was a lot of fun if anybody came. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> uh, the support team and the community ambassadors, they had a tent and they did an excellent job. The community ambassador program was wonderful. They ended up, I don't know how many, I think it's in the report and how many people they actually got contact info from, but it, I don't think it would have been possible without our, uh, support team and the community ambassadors with all their public outreach. Um, then also, last but not least, we have hired Thomas Smith with the Division of Firefighter EMT. He's a graduate of the 2022 Fire Academy. Uh, he's a volunteer at Black Canyon and he worked for us on the fuels group. And so we were able to pluck him over to this side. We actually had a number of good candidates. It was probably the closest hiring process I think we've ever had, which is pretty good. It's pretty good problem. It's a good, it's a good problem to have. We also developed a hiring list out of that that we're going to keep for the next year. Uh, Call-wise, uh, about normal is usually one of our busy months. Um, you know, 2020 was an anomaly like everything in 2020. Uh, volunteer firefighters had 300 hour, 307 hours of staffing. We averaged 3.25 members per call. 21% um, of the calls overlapped, and our average response time was 910. Uh, fires, we've continued to have wildland fires. I think everybody heard of lightning um, or heard the thunder, seen the lightning, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, we are getting a number of positive strikes, but all the moisture, most of the time, it's single tree, couple tree. It's not even getting out of the tree well because all the grass is so green. Um, our crews have done a great job of keeping them very small. So we've been having fires, but they're not going anywhere, which is totally appropriate for this time of year, which is excellent. Um, Let's see, mutual aid, we did have 12 cents of mutual aid over the month and transports were fairly surprising. Obviously, calls are on track and higher, transports are down. Um, but that's about normal with what every month has been. Uh, training, 200 hours, 208 hours of training for the month. Um, we are pushing this out and we reconfigured it for a training captain position as opposed to a training chief position for several organizational reasons. Um, but that job is going to go live today, probably at midnight or so. We're going to post it internally first, see if we have any, we have several internal candidates interested. Obviously, we always rather hire internally than external, just because I, I think it's good business. Um, also, a big one is we've been talking to Black Canyon for probably the last couple of years about their burn building. They're going to build a new one. They have a, currently a burn building. It's older. It's, it's almost worn out. 
Um, and they're going to build a newer one out of Connexes, which is what a lot of West Metro has, Lawn, Fairmont. So you get Connexes, and then you line them with heat tiles, and you can do all your live fire training in it. Live fire training is critical to firefighters. It's super important. Um, you know, wildland fires, you can go out on wildland fires, you can experience that, you can get that, you bring that here, that training. Structural fire training is tough. You need that class A fire to, you know, experience the heat, experience the fire, and actually do those training evolutions. Since I've been in this position, we've only been able to go to Platte Canyon because during the pandemic, all of the facilities that we go to shut down to any outside agency. So we usually go down the hill to West Metro, Fairmont, Denver to utilize their facilities. This is it's also costly. We spend about three thousand dollars per trip down there. We have to pay for the facility fee, the uh, facility managed to be on site, etc. So about three thousand dollars per, and we usually end up going to three per year, which obviously we spend about ten thousand dollars. So Black Canyon has been talking about the barn building. I've uh, been talking to Chief Mulligan quite a bit, and yesterday we came to agreement that we were going to help fund their burn building um, out of Connexes. And it's not going to be much more than our three burn buildings that we budgeted for this year. And so we're going to, you're going to see another IGA, as I was probably with the IGA, with Black <laughs> Canyon Fire to do a cost share on the new burn building. And then we're actually going to have uh, one of our individuals, um, Jeff Kleinfeld, is going to be sitting in on the design committee. So we actually have a skin in the game. We're going to put some money towards it. We're going to help with the design. And then we're going to have a class A fire a class A training building that we can go to any time, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we've never had that opportunity before. Um, and then also another exciting thing in training, one of our individuals, John, John Buchschmidt, sorry about that, was he was the first participant of the Ralph Fund. That fund, that scholarship fund has been going on for, I almost want to say 10 years. Ralph Mann was our only line of duty death here at Elk Creek Fire. Mm -hmm. And there was the money donated his name. He was very very training, and so decided by the membership a number of years ago that this money should go towards training. Many people have applied for it, but he was one of the first people to actually close the deal. The way it works is you have to apply for it, you have to accept it, then you have to finish usually a class. So he finished his DMT class, paid for it on his internal paperwork, and he was reimbursed for the full cost of class, which, which is, is, is pretty exciting. It, it offers another avenue for volunteers for some of the things that we can't pay for. Uh, fire prevention. Um, over the last, this this is actually a, another pretty big one. Over the last five years, our fire marshal Roger Parker has worked to bring our commercial occupancy into compliance with fire code. For those of you who don't know, when he first started, we had one of our restaurants, for instance, their deep fryer consisted of a five gallon bucket of grease on their range. There's no range hood, no suppression system, no nothing. This is a long term restaurant. Wow. Fire marshal Parker came in and informed them that. Much like every other restaurant, you probably need a suppression system. Um, it, was, it was a pretty big battle, it was a pretty big deal. But as of this month, 96.76% of our annual and semi-annual fire protection system reports show that our systems are in compliance. We've never had that. Um, which it, it, it's pretty funny. It's a testament to Roger Parker and how 40 some odd years of being a fire marshal his experience and his, his efficiency to set that up, which is which is great. Um, fleet and equipment, our new escape is getting graphics right now, and it should be here. Um, we did just have another truck that, uh, one of the new trucks, it hasn't even had an oil change yet, but it started using oil. It's now like a quart and a half low over last week, and it's not leaking. <laughs> and so that's the same thing that one of the other trucks did. It ended up with a new motor. Um, so we'll see where that goes. So we have one of those out of service. The Schmiel from February is still out of service. I don't know when that's ever going to come back. Um, they can't get a windshield and they're still missing the light bar. Okay. Um, and facility, the backup generator station three we failed to start last month. That generator is critically important. It converts all of our communications there. You know, we have battery backups, but if the generator doesn't start, we've had several issues with it over the last couple of years. Uh, it is 19 years old. Their recommended end of life is 20. Um, so we are working with some of our partners at Core Electric. They mm -hmm. rent a lot of space up there. Mm -hmm. They're going to cost share a new generator. So hopefully, that's what they said. So it's getting to be budget time. So we're going to be exploring that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the wildland report for Elk Creek and Canyon, the wildland division. Wildfire prepared is still going really well. It's you know the voluntary assessments, twenty four assessments for the uh, month. We had three assessments for the program grant in Hilldale. That's the uh, resident assistance grant that we got. 
And then Kelly also, when she's not doing assessments, which is very rarely, we do, she is a firefighter as well. So we do pluck her away and she does fires, which is a huge help. The ambassador program is, yeah, again, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the, the, the group is doing really well. Um, they're starting to develop their own relationships and it's, uh, at the uh, elevation celebration, it was tremendous. So they ended up getting contact information for 69 residents and 20, 28 different planning units. Wow. We started having people coming up asking about the planning units because they heard about somebody else. So I, I think there's a, that's kind of proof of concept with that. It, it seems to be working. Coast law, I'm gonna let Captain Yellen talk about that. That's uh, the large grant that I touched on last month. We're starting to refine the way that's gonna work. Um, Glen Elk, it's uh, still checking away. They're nearly done with that. And the fuels crew, um, fuels crew at the beginning of July, they ended up with a bit of a COVID fest. Everybody was out, but one or two with COVID. It just everybody got sick. It it was it was a challenge. Um, the module ended up jumping in and helping out. And even though with everybody being sick, we ended up getting 156 addresses done, which is pretty good, not too bad. Big thing is almost every house is pushing its maximum. Every house is doing 15 piles. Every house is doing, each pile is five by five by five. Everybody is, in years past, you get to a house and somebody's going to have an armload too. But now, I, I think, yet again, it's showing the proof of concept. Everybody's taking advantage of the program, which is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also got the Masticator from Jeffco. Um, and we're looking at where we're going to start implementing that. That's going to work more down in the Inner Canyon District. It's better for a lot of the brush. Um, we're still trying to figure out how we're gonna work that in. It's probably gonna start working over the winter once chipping is completed. And the module, they, they're back on their second trip in Texas. They uh, spent a lot of time there in the balmy 112 degree weather, 100% humidity. Um, and that's about what we have. With that, I'm gonna turn that over to Captain Yellen and he's gonna go over that code swap grant. Like I said, we were awarded last month, literally the day before the board meeting and it, it's semi complicated, so I didn't really want to touch on it. He can actually go into the uh, go into the details. We're happy to have you, Kevin. You know, <laughs> educate us. I will try and make it as simple as possible. <laughs> uh, so, thanks everybody. My name is Benjamin Hill. I'm the wildland captain here at Oak Creek. If you know me, um, Coast Swap has been a, a big thing in the newspapers for the state of Colorado and the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, which is a new grant at the state is generally what you find at the Colorado State Forest Service level. So this is an interesting grant to be a part of the first round. Um, really, however, this started about four years ago. So as part of this whole explanation, I needed to take a step back. Um, a long time ago, about four years ago, you were updated that I was participating with the Upper South Point Partnership for the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative. Um, that was a large proposal um, at the state level to basically fix the problem, was what they said. So uh, the Upper South Platte Partnership is, again, all of our partners in Jefferson County and Park County, U.S. Forest Service, Open Space, um, Jefferson Conservation District, a number of fire protection districts. We all got together and made a proposal for the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative. For the plan work that we had to fix the wildfire problem in the Upper South Platte Partnership, we asked for $29 million. We didn't get $29 million. Uh, nobody got actually a fair amount of money. Um, it was an interesting process to go through. However, it did one thing. It prioritized us at the state level. And so we're one of three areas now in the state that gets priority funding for new grants like this. So um, really RMRI started the whole process four years ago. And so Jefferson County and Upper South Platte Partnership um, was the only place in the state to get two bids at Coast Swap grants. Mm -hmm. Are you following so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So instead of just one the $1 million pot that most counties got, we got two. And so a lot of what we did is coordinate together because um, we do that on a monthly basis anyway. And we managed the $2 million together within the bidding process. That was a very large headache. Um, but it came to fruition here and this is what you're seeing. So 
Um, all of those projects are on the docket. Um, and really what I'm trying to do is not explain whether it's Jefferson County money or Upper South Platte Partnership money, because it really doesn't matter. Um, there's a lot of acres that are going to be treated out of this and more significantly, a lot of homes um, using the wildfire prepared program. So as you can see, it's a lot of Jefferson County. It does go into Evergreen um, in some of these areas, and it does go into Park County for the Upper South Platte Partnership funding. Um, and really, we, what we have is approximately 10 landscape scale projects with a radius of two miles for homeowners to participate in the 50-50 grant, just like we're doing at Hilldale. So 2,500 match. Um, we're going to prioritize planning units. We still haven't done that yet. There's a lot of um, coordination that's going on with this, especially with the county. Um, Upper South Platte Partnership, they're more used to this collaborative. Um, this is kind of our entrance into hanging out with the county bunch. So um, we're, we're creating a lot of partnerships. I'm uh, very confident this is going to work because Jefferson County open space is also part of the Upper South Platte mm -hmm. Partnership. Okay. And so um, let me go to the next slide here. Um, Can you put it on the presentation? Line? Yeah. Thank you. So let me go back to the last one there. And this is a presentation that I stole from the commission meeting. So is that a little bit more legible there? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Okay. And I'll go through this with the numbers just so you know what we're talking about. So in Ullman Park, uh, which is private property, we're going to do 50 acres. Uh, with JCD, Blue Creek 2 um, up in Evergreen is 150 acres. Dedease Park, 50 with Denver Mountain Park. Stanley Park, which is almost right on our border, 60 with DMP. The Jerome Miller project that you see at the bottom there is 56 acres. And I guess what I have to emphasize here is there are so many more projects on the ground that have been done and are planned that it fits into the grand scheme of things at the Upper South Platte Partnership. So it looks a little scattershot, but it's playing off other projects that have either been implemented or planning to implement with additional funding. Jefferson County, in fact, is taking some of this funding, funding and leveraging it. They've leveraged $7 million in the last six months. Wow. And so we're starting to get ball rolling for a number of different projects that we'll probably update you here in a little while. Um, the wildfire prepared program through the USPP is getting approximately 50 homes out of that pot of funding. The Elk Meadow and Beaver Ranch is what I want to go to next. Yeah. So Beaver Ranch Park was a priority area for Jefferson County open space. They've done their forest mitigation plan. I'm sorry, their forest inventory um, and Beaver Ranch Park with the number of homes, with the number of, with the amount of infrastructure around there was a priority area for them. We're there going to do 101 acres in that park. Okay. And then Elk Meadow, up in Evergreen, is also surrounded by a bunch of neighborhoods, as you guys know. Um, and they're going to do 140 acres there. So that's about $400,000 that they're matching on top of that to create about $800,000 worth of work just on open space. Um, the wildfire prepared program um, for Elk Creek, Inner Canyon, and Evergreen is going to get approximately 160 homes for that funding. And so we've got a lot of work to do. Um, we have to prioritize a number of things moving forward. Um, but right now, that's the Coast Wild funding that's living in Elk Creek. Um, <laughs> Technically, my name is on the project, um, but with through all the partnerships, we have a lot of support to make sure all this funding gets done on the ground. We have another $200,000 that uh, we're going to do an inventory, how do I put it in the um, grant, the inventory and risk assessment. Um, the county has been public that they're updating their whole comprehensive plan, their transportation plan, um, their CWPP. I'm missing, I don't think I'm missing anything there. Um, and so they bid this thing out for an entire project. Mm -hmm. What we wanted to make sure was that wildfire was the focus when that entire planning process. So $200,000 of the Coast Swap funding is going to bring experts, national experts, 
to do this inventory to make sure that the planning department, the, all of the systems within the county, their partners, us included, are all figuring the wildfire problem out accordingly. So that does include an evaluation of all the comprehensive plans currently and, and plan all of the area plans, building codes, you name it. So that's also part of the project. And that's really all I have. Do you have any questions based off of that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like great work. Yeah. Cool. Is, is this available on our website somewhere? It is not. There's a reason for that. This is not to just hold the information. Uh, there's a lot more coordination going on in terms of outreach. So we're going to try and utilize outreach to everybody with just a single outreach platform through USPP and the county. And so to get everybody in the room has been a challenge. There's a lot of people on vacation, frankly. Um, and so within the next month or so, as it prioritizes out, uh, we'll do a lot more um, a lot more outreach, a lot more um, celebrating of this fact, basically. But it's it's taken a fair amount just to get everybody during their summer vacations and everything like that. What we don't want to do is push it out and then have to change it. Yeah. So, right. anything else? Yes. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, old business. Let me just update on the community outreach committee. I am a little behind. We are planning a meeting. Uh, this, we're trying to coordinate a meeting for next week at some point, and then we'll report back out at the next uh, month's meeting. So it's still moving forward. We're just uh, it's 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 all on, it's on me. Um, service agreements and new development. Um, I, uh, I think this is one of those ones that at this point, um, I'm suggesting that we we table this uh, item. Uh, generally, I know that last month we were talking in sort of general terms about the benefits of service agreements versus impact fees. I think the rationale behind sort of tabling this is that it's it was I was reminded that we are in active litigation and service agreements are part of that uh, issue. And we may get some information that would benefit our discussions about these things at the conclusion of the, of the lawsuit. So in light of sort of the tenderness of where we're at with those, those issues and the litigation moving forward, I think it would be behoove us to table this, know that it's coming back, that we really do need to have a discussion about this as a future part. Let's make sure that we've got the, the things in place and know sort of the outcome of the current litigation uh, is of that. Do I have any questions, comments, concerns about that? Just, I was just going to say, I really support what you just said. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. To me. Director Pixley, anything? No, I would full agreement that in light of the sensitive nature of this lawsuit and any pitting litigation that we need to uh, respect and allow that process to continue before we start to uh, further our discussions in that realm. Okay, so I, I appreciate all of that and uh, we'll move that uh, back onto the agenda as old business once where we're at um, in that process. Memorandum of understanding for the Conifer Counseling. Remember, we had a discussion about this. This is providing um, support services for firefighters here in the district and others. Uh, it's just an agreement so that we know have a place to go. We just didn't have the MOU in front of us last time. Um, I guess all I really need is a motion to enter into the MOU. I make said motion. Okay. Second. 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 <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Chief, or I, I guess Melissa make a note that that was approved today. And then I, I know that Director Pixley is back in town yeah. tomorrow. So we'll execute Perfect. The MOUs from there. Okay, that's easy. 
Uh, next part, public hearing for inclusion of 13640 Old Paint Trail. So this is including a piece of property that's outside of our district into our district. Uh, are there any folks here who want to comment about the inclusion? Hearing none, I would entertain discussion and or if no discussion, a motion to approve the inclusion of the 3640 trail as described on exhibit A. Uh, into the fire district. We discussed this already, so um, that was something we discussed last board meeting. So I would make a motion that we accept the inclusion. 15640 open. I second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Same thing. Please note that it was approved today. And then uh, Director Pixley will sign uh, for the board tomorrow or sometime this week. Okay. Uh, on to new business. Let's uh, see, what did I do? Okay, we're still on track. Um, authorization expenditures for the consolidation market research. So this was the RFP that we discussed last week that was put up and then moving forward, putting aside money to uh, once that's approved, um, or once once there's a well, if we approve the money, then to find somebody to provide the services, and it's uh, if I'm understanding right, it's a it's it's an approval for up to an expenditure up to thirty thousand dollars by Elk Creek, which also the other members of the consolidation group, so North Fork, Inner Canyon, Elk Creek. Each will be guaranteed thirty thousand. Now that we'll have that expenditure, right. at least we'll have that cap to get to um, in that process. So, discussion. Uh, Director Wagner, I think before we have discussion, we need to make the motion to approve the expenditure. Thank you, Director Pixley. Yes, I'm I'm lax on my rules tonight. Um, no problem. A, and in in that discussion, I will make the motion as to approve the thirty thousand dollars for this expenditure, up to thirty thousand. I beg your pardon. Up to thirty thousand dollars for this expenditure. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second. Discussion. Oh, I, I've got a couple of things. Um, Mr. White has sent an email, and I did want to address a couple things that you had in here. Uh, so, one of the questions he has is the bigger government yield better government? I don't necessarily think the government applies. You know, all of our fire chiefs, we're looking at this from a service standpoint. I believe we can provide better service rate tactics. It's a nonpartisan issue, as far as I'm concerned. And ultimately, consolidating, we will be able to provide better service rate tactics. That's the bottom line. So that's, that's the way I see it. Uh, another question was how would the consolidation increase or decrease volunteerism? I think it's going to increase volunteerism. Uh, we'll have better support services or volunteers. We're going to have a larger training division. You know, several of our goals are to increase the training opportunities for people. I think it will increase volunteerism. Just as a larger entity, we're going to have more resources to have a better opportunity to train volunteers and offer more training, which is key. Um, then, 
So that's addressing the next question about decreasing volunteers. Ability to pass future mill levies, you know, if depending on how we consolidate in the past, it's just one entity. So one entity would just pass mill levies the same way separate entities would. Um, and this is the big one. How would consolidation impact arrival time of an ambulance fire engine at my home? It's going to increase. The idea is probably 90% of our calls, a minute delay doesn't make a difference. There's 10% of our calls where minutes make a difference when we get to a house. Every month we have overlapping calls. You know, over the last couple of days, I don't know, uh, how many runs have we had in two days now? Several. <laughs> we've had several runs. We've had overlapping calls. Myself, Chief Aronson, we've all been running around on calls. We've been calling mutual aid on stop. So when we call for mutual aid, there's a delay in it. So we get, on, we get on a scene and we have to call for mutual aid, especially if you're in Park County. We call for mutual aid on the radio. It goes to dispatch. Then they put it out there. You have probably a three to four minute delay. There's no way to work around that. That's just the way it is. With a larger organization, we're not going to have that. What's going to happen is we're going to call. If we have overlapping calls, the goal is to have a larger pool of volunteers spread across the district and more real estate. You're going to have more volunteers available to respond from home as well as the volunteer staff in the stations. So I, I think, if anything, it will increase response time or it will decrease response time. It will increase resources responding to houses and to calls for service. Um, that's really what I believe, you know, whether or not, I mean, that, that's what our consolidation study said. That's where I'm at on it. I know we have a disagreement on it. Um, that's where I'm at with it. You know, I, I've been living this for the last two and a half years. You know, that's what we've been looking at. The fire chief, every week we meet and discuss and look at what we can do and how we can make this work. You know, the idea is to make a more functional agency to help all of us are looking at, if, if you read any story across the country, volunteerism is declining. The volunteer fire service is dying. It's a harsh reality. And, you know, some people want to say, well, just get more volunteers. And I will challenge anybody, go find them. You know, there's stories across the East Coast of fire departments just going out of business. They have no more volunteers, so they close the doors. Not a great option. We're lucky in the fact that we have a very robust volunteer component right now. Same with Inner Canyon, same with North Park. Our idea with this is to get ahead of that. Because in five years, I don't know where we're going to be. You know, 20 years ago, Elk Creek had 65 volunteers. You know, you go to a call, there's seven people on every single call. As calls go up, the demographic has changed up here. You know, nobody's buying a house up here for $100,000. Not a thing. For people to live up here, they have to work very hard. And I really believe, you know, in the Chiefs we've all talked about, that's one of the reasons that the demographic is changing and volunteerism is going down. People want to do other things. And I fully support that. I mean, spend time with family, loved ones, go out to dinner, all those things. Not volunteering. The bulk of our calls are during the day. We can run analytics. And I think it's 3.30 on Thursdays are call volume. <laughs> that's not conducive for people who have day jobs. You know, we do have a lot of great volunteers that can help with that, but by increasing the pool, I, I think we're going to be able to offer better service. So that 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 addresses that that hopefully addresses some of your concerns. Um, I appreciate the comments, by the way, and you've all received them and read them. And, uh, <coughs> That. Can I ask uh, the members who are have been involved in sort of the consolidation uh, meetings? I mean, I know there haven't been that many, but um, just the tenor of the commitment of the boards towards consolidation. So I, my sense is we're getting closer as we've narrowed down to more important. Director Woods, would you like to start off, please? Uh, um. I missed the last meeting about the shared services, or maybe somebody else. Can you know, I, I can chime in about that one, but yes. Yeah. Um, I would say that the most part consolidation committee, services committee, whatever we're going to call ourselves, are in favor of this. There are that you was talking about volunteers, bigger pool of volunteers. Um, you know, I mean, we all volunteer, right? So, and I know what kind of time it takes 
for just us, but it's more critical. We're not critical human beings to the fire department, but the volunteers that fight the fires are critical to the fire department. So I think that's what most of the discussion has been in the committee meeting. There might be a couple outliers um, in terms of not 100% behind this, but I think they're coming around. We see this as an advantage for the fire districts, having one district and being able to pull volunteers from one district, bigger district, more volunteers makes a lot of sense. Um, Director Pixley, do you have something else to add? Yes, I keep muting myself. I apologize for the delay. I, I uh, am in total agreement with what Director Wood said. And I know that Chief Sherlaw and Chief uh, Ware and our other partners and our surrounding agencies all have a very similar approach. And we need to consolidate resources. With the changing climate, with the more intense fires, with the issues surrounding, they don't even call them wild land fires anymore. These are wild fires and they take that name literally because of the intense and dangerous situations that these, this new era that we are in provides. We don't know how this consolidation needs to move forward. We know that we have to find ways to address how to educate the public to find out what their concerns are so that we are in a better position to be able to give them the information for a better understanding of what this consolidation effort means. We are different departments, different philosophies, different cultures, different um, personalities, but we all have the same need. And that is to protect our beautiful environment, our beautiful community. And if we don't research the best process to try to incorporate a way to give us the, the, the most capable fire department to provide these services, we could have a catastrophic loss of hundreds, if not thousands of homes, and perhaps even losses of life. But since we don't know what we don't know about what is needed in this consolidation effort, we need to find out how to proceed. We cannot go at this ignorantly. I, as every one of you, are a resident of our beautiful community. And I, as every one of you, I hope want to have the best fire protection that we are capable of providing for our family, our friends, and our neighbors. I believe that spending this realistically a minimal amount of money, less than $30,000, to explore the process of how best to incorporate our sisters and brothers in our neighboring communities and fire departments is the most prudent way for us to have an understanding of how to give us the best protection that we can for our community. We know that there are dangers. We know that there are situations that we cannot control and mother nature is going to dictate that. But we also know that we can do our due diligence in trying to provide the process and the, the capability for our departments to give us the best protection. And this amount of money, this minimal amount of money, the way I look at it, because a loss of life, you cannot put a numeric value on. This, this, this up to $30,000 with our partnering agencies to determine what the needs of our community are, give our community a voice to be able to provide us an opportunity to understand what the concerns are. I believe it to be unrealistic to not look at it in a larger perspective. And I believe it in terms of what our neighboring and our own community believes. And I believe it to be unrealistic for us not to put this first and foremost as we see these these very significant and changing situations in our environment. I would ask that my board members vote in the affirmative in uh, support of this motion 
so that we can move forward and do and find out what is necessary for us to do the best we can for our neighbors, our families, and our friends. Ellen, let me make some comments here. Um, first of all, Chief, I I, uh, I agree with a lot of the uh, uh, information values that you put forward here uh, this evening. The thing that concerns me is that if you look at the way the RFP is written, first of all, the scope of the work is very succinct and open to interpretation. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we are not really focusing on interacting with uh, our citizens. And I'm talking about the citizens within the district. So I would be in favor, I, I would be a yes vote on this if, if I were convinced that that it's going to be, this effort is going to be citizen focused and, and information, um, uh, in, information and fact, fact based and not, um, and, and not a marketing based effort. Of course. In, so, what we, the way we came up with this consolidation committee and group. We kind of ran it after the same way Inner Canyon did the last mill levy. So the, the first thing I really believe we have to we have to hear what people say. The only way we're going to do this, and I don't believe that over 400 square miles and what 23,000 some odd people, I don't believe that we have the skill set to do that internally. I believe hiring a professional marketing firm that can reach out to those people, ask those people on a survey what they want. That's why it is the thing because really, ultimately. This is yet again the same way our canyon did there. There's three questions. Do you support a consolidation? You know, obviously there's some supporting documentation. Do you use the what you know, what are your service expectations? You know, and we may have, it's totally fine. You know, if two people come to our house within 20 minutes, great. I think we, you know, we may have people, you know, some people in our neighborhood have moved in as in everybody's their floor that it's going to take 10 minutes for somebody to get to their house. But I think, you know, so we have that. And then also the floor for funding, because once we identify what the service expectation is and the tolerance for funding, that's going to be the gap. People aren't going to want to pay more. I know that. That's just the reality of our times. But I don't believe that we'll be able to get that information without reaching out to every single individual within those districts. That, that's why I believe using the market research firm is the way to go. Can I respond to that? Of course. Uh, so I want to make sure that the information is flowing two ways. Not only do we hear uh, from the citizenry and what their expectations are, but also that we uh, convey information to them, facts, the point figures. Uh, and because I believe that there is uh, a lot of unknowns and and the, and, and that the citizens are looking to us for leadership. They are looking to us to convey the, the sort of messaging that you presented this evening, but but to go even broader and deeper, okay? So on that basis, I mean, if that is the idea here, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. hundred percent, the whole idea is to get basically these three questions, to get to gauge the appetite of the public for this. And we've already talked about, we talked about it at the uh, consolidation committee. The appetite for the public is absolutely not. Everybody likes, this is the way it is. We're not changing this what we want. That's fine too. But I don't feel we can do anything else until we know what the bulk of people say about it. Once we have that, then, I mean, this is going to be the most transparent thing possible. It will be information back and forth. We'll have all these bits. And then once we have what people's expectation is, then hopefully we can try to meet that. But, but again, I, I, want to, I want to make sure that we're clear on this. And that is that, that we as a district have a common vision for what the issues are, you know, what the benefits are, 
and what the challenges are as well. Very realistic. Okay. May I speak to that, uh, Chief Ware? May I speak to that comment? Like, just, uh, Director Perry, just, just a moment. I'm just right in the middle. Uh, I'll yield the floor as soon as I'm done. Thank you. Um, I want to make sure that that we present to the public the benefits clearly as you see them, as we all see them, but also the, 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 the possible challenges. Oh, yeah. I want to make sure that we're very clear on that and very realistic about presenting that to, to the citizens. Oh, yeah. I don't want, want to be there to be any misunderstanding when we're in the middle and, and, and when we're done with this, I'm raising the question where do we go from here? What do we do? And, and put it to the citizens. I believe that. That there need, needs to be a clear decision on their part I, because they have all the facts. I agree 100%. Okay. So it's, it has to be transparent. This has to be driven by our citizens. You know, ultimately, it's driven by the citizens, the taxpayers of our district. And the only reason any of us are here is because of our taxpayers. Right. If it's not driven by them and if they don't have their input and we're not meeting their needs, we shouldn't be doing any of it. Right. So that's, that's fine. Director Pixley? Yes, uh, I was just going to mention to uh, Director Nervi that we have three, we have partnering agencies that are working in the same effort as I, as us, as Director Woods and myself and uh, Chief Ware. We have other board members from other fire districts that all have the same concerns. We are all looking for information. And it is not something that we would be exclusively holding to ourselves. Our goal is to take the information provided us once we have the approval from our boards to be able to use this study to determine how best to move forward. But as I mentioned earlier, when I was speaking in favor of the motion, we don't know what we don't know. We need to get this information. And it is not going to benefit us to to hold the information to our chest and not be able and not to provide the information that we are finding. There is going to be transparency and there is going to be open discussion amongst the fire board so that we can have an opportunity to take this issue and move it in a positive direction if there is the uh, affirmative response and once we have an understanding from our community members. Director Baker, any comments? Nope. I will at least um, hopefully address this somewhat. I mean, this is, we may say that it's a market or market research group, but in some, in reality, this is a survey of interests. Yeah. And yeah. the provisions of building a survey like that would prohibit us from promoting one direction or the other of the respondents. Now, I get your point that there may not be enough sufficient information for people to respond to this, but that's part of what we will learn in the survey process. So this is a, in my mind, this is the first step in actually giving us additional information about how best to approach citizen engagement in the consolidation. That's one. Second point is in my time on this board, for all intents and purposes, Inner Canyon and Elk Creek have really functioned as a joint fire department, even though it's through mutual calls and everything else. I mean, as long as I've been here, there has been a discussion and movement towards agreements about how to do this more effectively. And in the in the folks that I've talked to who, uh, as firefighters, uh, and now recently, just because I've been introduced to another volunteer from Northburg, support and interest of the firefighters to have this larger place with more support, more units, more capacity, uh, which has been proved up in their connected work in the IGAs that we've signed. 
is is incredibly important and um, and it's worth exploring. And this is one additional step. I mean, we got to get off that point of just talking about consolidation and actually get some feedback about what we need to do next to help people feel like this is really what the underlying basis is, which is to provide better fire protection and emergency services to the people of all of these districts. And I truly believe that we're gonna see that when we do this consolidation on the bed. Or at least I hope that's what the outcome is. So with that, we have a motion. We need a second. We got a second. Yes. So all we need now is a vote. Do I hear? Uh, um, well, angel singing. <laughs> can I ask for a vote of, of the board members to accept the? Um, my call an authorization for the expenditures for the consolidation uh, research uh, up to $30,000. So it would be a survey process of, um, to reach out to citizens for up to $30,000 by Elk Creek. Do you want to vote? Yes. Please. Aye. Aye. I vote in affirmative. Last person, I'll vote aye as well. Carries. To go forward. All right. Wildland Division IGA. Uh, oh, letter. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Can't read my own writing. Uh, letter to the bike. Um, Mr. I can touch on this. Okay. Um, I have had insane from people in my office several weeks telling us how they stopped the bike ranch and how the Elk Creek has now partnered with the bike ranch. Mm -hmm. They said that on the presentation. And they also have it on the website. And so I think they the board have to remove that because we don't have a partnership as far as I know, unless somebody else, I, I have no idea. Um, oh, they also mentioned the state forest service as well. Um, so they may be getting another thing from that. I, I think maybe a letter from the board saying that we've removed the term partnership from your website. I don't think it can be long and drawn out but I, I think it 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 alludes to having some sort of relationship with them that we do not have um and it adds a lot of complexity um there are a number of people that tell me that several times a week in my office and that if we don't stop it they're going to sue us well it's not our job to stop it unfortunately it has been pushed out there that it's right but it's misinformation, but it's the, it's the job of the planning commissioners to recommend approval denial. It is the job of the board of county commissioners to approve our denial. Correct. Okay, so, so I vote let's get a letter and they need to remove the board partnership from the website. Yeah, so in times past, what, when the board has sent a letter like this, it's been a very simple. It hasn't had to wait till the next board meeting. It's usually drafted by the president. And I mean, this one seems pretty easy. Yeah. That's kind of you guys as to how that gets. So together. Director Pixley, are you willing to write a letter? I don't really believe this takes a board action. I mean, I think it's important for us to reach out to them and say, you need Please. to cease and desist. Yeah. Um, we are not in a, any kind of agreement discussion at this point about any kind of agreement or support. Yes. Uh I, I would agree, but I, I think as the board members in solidarity agreeing that this is the best method so that the public sees that we have their best interests in mind and we as a collective address this misconception that is being promoted by the bike park. That was my intent for making a motion that the board and the department work together to provide this, this missive so that we can uh, have them understand that this is a, uh, an inconsistency and an uh, it, it's an issue that needs to be addressed most immediately. Great, well, I will do this then. I will accept your motion to, for the, the board to draft a letter by Director Pixley as president to the board to be sent to the bike park, whomever um, leadership. And we, uh, well, let me just 
back up and get a second second for that if you've seconded. Second. Um, All, right. <laughs> All right. Aye. So Aye. We have a supportive board and Director Pixley getting that letter done for us this week and removing us from the controversy and the misunderstanding of what the process is. Thank Wild you very much. Division. You bet. Thank you for bringing it. Um, IGA for Wildland Division. Uh, this is actually, I probably could have done this as an addendum, but this just adds North Fork to the Conifer Wildfire Division. So that's made up of us and Inner Canyon. It's where we operate with pretty much every, almost every wildland program we have. We're going to bring the fork into the fold. The reason we're doing this is if we have this, then Captain Yelling and Captain Mandel can operate on behalf of North Fork at a lot of these meetings and speak to, you know, speak for them, as well as work on CWPP. They're looking at updating CWPP. They're updating CWPP. And by using their local knowledge of all the work they put with ours, it, it's going to make that process a lot smoother for North Fork. So that, that's what that's all this is. There's no money exchange or anything like that. It's just services. Can I have a motion to approve or enter into the IGA between Elk Creek, Inner Canyon, North Fork uh, for the Wildland Division? Okay. Second. You. All in favor? Aye. 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 Same thing as last time. Note that it was approved today, and uh, Director Pixley will sign as president when he's back in Colorado. Go ahead. Am I okay to go yep. forward? Yep. Uh, last, IGA. Love these IGAs. <laughs> and there's no errors. I love this. This is the part I love. So, uh, second <laughs> amendment, please, <laughs> can you address uh, the fee associated with the backup fiber connection? Yes. So, JT Mars is our radio system that we have between all the fire departments here. Um, we need a fiber backup in case we have a failure to migrate panel. Um, they've explored a bunch of options and the fiber makes the most sense. As far as I'm concerned, I don't really think this is an optional IGA because so many guests come with another backup for our radios. Uh, the, the money is it's right around 14,000 split between everybody. So I think our total liability will probably be, I don't know, seven, eight. So it, it's not going to be a huge liability on it. They're still working on finalizing all the proposals, but really, as we all agreed in the last chief meeting, Honestly, it doesn't matter what it costs. If it costs five hundred thousand dollars, we'd probably look at doing that because we don't really have an option. So that that's where this is. Can I entertain a motion to enter into the IGA for a fiber backup? So moved. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Same thing as last time. Noted as being approved. Yep. Yep. Blah blah blah. Uh, we come to citizens' issues. Do we have any comments from the floor? Please keep it short. Go ahead. I do have a few comments here. And um, my experience is uh, working in the uh, Friends of Elk Creek in the fall of 2013, the fall of 2019, uh, more likely in 2019. I do know that it's an enormous struggle to get something presented to the community. We did it, uh, and in both of those campaigns, there was absolutely no expenditures by uh, Elk Creek in terms of uh, supporting the campaign. That the fire chief, previous fire chief, could state the need, but he couldn't say, well, yes. So, uh, I'm very concerned that this agreement is going to be basically campaigning because all of the fire chiefs will have to uh, support consolidation. So they will be making an argument for it. And then who's going to say, why should we not go for this? So it that uh, in, in the election of 2019, maybe that was the high water mark, hopefully not. We had 66% uh, voted yes for a significant no levy increase, and 33% voted no. So I have this feeling inside of me that there's going to be 33% that are going to say no, even though 
their life may depend upon not having an ambulance some, some days. So I have a feeling there'll be 33% that vote no on the consolidation, 33% that say yes automatically, and then it's a contest between the remaining 33% to uh, determine whether to be cash or not. So I may suppose you come up with a lot and you can't really figure it out. I don't believe you're going to get a definitive landslide one way or another. So it may come out as, well, you really can't tell. So, uh, but, and I'm um, kind of against having somebody else come up with the ideas. I think it ought to be within the arguments for consolidation should come from, uh, arise naturally from the boards and the officers of the fire protection districts and their statement of the need should make it absolutely clear and and what have you to the uh, populace. So um, I don't think we need to hire somebody to come up with something. And uh, if you wanted to, you could have rent out uh, the cafetoria in McConnell High School and have the three boards of directors meet and discuss in the morning and then devote the afternoon to having the citizenry and a Zoom attend audience to come in and uh, say, here's what we think. And then that would be an introduction to the community. So. Uh, we we don't need to spend thirty thousand dollars to to make great reach outs to the community and also the Conquer Area Council and so forth. So, uh, um, and then the other thing that I'm concerned and worried about is uh, how does this consolidation project and in terms of the deadline or time that it's going to appear on the ballot, how does that affect Mill Creek's Mill Levy uh, extension or hopefully making it permanent? which I presume will be in the fall of 2023. So there'll be all kinds of things. If it's not on the ballot at the same time, and I don't know if that's even possible, but I presume it has to be uh, done within 2023. How will all of this information or misinformation of a consolidation swirling around impact that 33% that are swayable yes or no on our mill levy increase? So, uh, I don't know if you guys have considered that, but I think that's really critically important. And then the other thing that's really, uh, sorry, I already knew it, but I read over that consolidation report and uh, that um, when you really look at it, we are the rich people of this triad in terms of the Magnificent 12 or whatever you want to call the uh, uh, full-time firefighters uh, four per ship, and the other two districts have nothing. So uh, I would think that the realization, once they start to think about this consolidation, they are going to demand, possibly as a hold the same hostage, to uh, some type of uh, full-time equivalence. Uh, I would say, say six for Inner Canyon and six for North Fork. They would give two per ship, and they're going to demand that want some kind of equity with what Mill Creek has, it's like, well, we have we have this richness here, and good luck out in uh, Pine Grove. So, uh, well, how will you act and respond to that when you've got four people sitting in Station One and uh, some desperate things going on further even further out in uh, Pine Grove? So, I feel that uh, some of this future may surprise you all in terms of what this consolidation may entail, and that there may be a uh, a demand from the uh, two uh, lesser well endowed things that uh, Elk Creek shed some of its uh, wealth and to help them out. So uh, I think there's all kinds of complexities and uh, and the uh, so that's those are some of the things that and and I'm really surprised that it has this momentous decision has not engendered a, a, a full scale discussion among uh, you the board and the citizens in Elk Creek, in, in terms of momentous decisions, is, is even equivalent to the uh, formation of the thing. So it's been a rather uh, docile uh, group in response. So uh, that's that's about all I have to say. All right, I appreciate your comments, and we'll take them into consideration. I think I think we have a long ways to go on the consolidation and the way that this information is, and we've had a commitment for transparency. And I appreciate your concerns. I think they are included in this process and 
I, I don't agree with you as to where we're at in this process or what this research uh, proposal is doing for us. So uh, I appreciate it very much. And any other comments from the citizens? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. I make the motion. Second. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Concludes the business of the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. On Thank the you all. Thank you.